Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. We're really pleased this afternoon to have Karen Harbour join us. Um, actually, we were hosting for Karen one of the first public appearances she made when she took the position as Assistant Secretary. And she wowed the crowd at that point, so we thought we'd invite her back a couple of years later. And had we known the turnout would be this significant, uh, we would have invited you back sooner, or we're going to get you out around town. With energy being so, uh, it's in the forefront of almost everything that goes on now in terms of uh, domestic policy, international policy, politics, and election year politics especially. We thought it would be useful to update you on some of the things that have been going on in terms of U.S. negotiations with international, both bilateral and ministerial meetings that have occurred. Uh, uh, APEC meeting, uh, ministerial, IEA ministerial, to just talk about what the U.S. has been doing in those relative fora and what the positions have been if they haven't been articulated clearly enough. We also want to spend part of the time, since she is Assistant Secretary for Policy and International, to talk about the domestic political situation and some of the legislation that's on the Hill, and she's agreed to do both and do both on the record. If you can hold your questions until the end, that would be extremely helpful. Um, and without that, your, your bio is upstairs. Most people know Karen, and that's why you're here, actually. So we're pleased to have her back, and Karen, the podium is yours. Frank, thank you for that kind introduction. The irony of this is, is that half of the staff that work for you used to work for me, so either I have bad retention or you have good recruitment, but either way, <laughs> I'm glad they're still doing energy policy uh, for, for the U.S. Um, like any good speaker, you've asked me to speak on a subject and I'm going to deviate from it immediately and talk about something else. Uh, because I think it's important before I go into the litany of the number of international fora in which we have been voicing our strong uh, opinions about what we need to do to enhance the world's energy security, I think we need to take a minute to remember the context in which we find ourselves, what's happening in the energy market, and then for me to tell you the message we've been sending to producers and consumers, and then to tell you where we've been doing it, and tell you what I see what's on the horizon, and the opportunities and the challenges uh, of delivering these messages, and actually getting the, the action that we want out of it. It's more about action and less about words these days. So first of all, what are the facts? And this is why I think that the world, the U.S. and other countries have put international energy security at the top of the foreign policy, on top of the economic policy, on top of the national security agenda of most countries. And you know, if you look at the facts, global energy consumption will increase by roughly 50 percent by 2030. Seventy percent of that growth will come from the world's emerging economies, and 30 percent of that growth will come from China alone. China has about 9 million cars on the road today. By 2030, we'll have well over 150 million cars. What type of fuel will those cars run on? Who's going to manufacture that steel? What type of pollution will that cause? We need to be concerned about that. Electricity growth. These are facts you may be acquainted with, but if you put them all together one bundle, it becomes very, very clear why it's at the top of everybody's agenda. Electricity growth is expected to be particularly steep rising, 100 percent between now and 2030. Yet still, we have close to 2 billion people that don't have access to electricity. And everybody's aim is to erase that gap. That will cause further strains on the energy sector infrastructure. The amount of investment needed just to meet the demand as we know it today is estimated to be $20 trillion. Where is that money going to come from? Is that money going to be able to be invested? 60 percent of that money is needed in the power sector and 40 percent is needed in oil and gas. We can't forget about the electricity investment that's needed. We're so focused on hydrocarbons, we forget that they actually generate electricity. Access to reserves is becoming increasingly limited. Roughly two-thirds of the world's oil and gas reserves are in countries that are providing limited access or now are completely closed to foreign investment. Roughly 50 percent of the world's proven oil reserves are in the hands of national oil companies. Upstream investment has risen, but not the share that's devoted to exploration. Upstream oil and gas investment has increased by 80 percent between 2000 and 2005, yet the share that's devoted to exploration has fallen from 31 percent to 10 percent. What that means is that there is an emphasis on production in this high-price environment rather than on exploration. 
that is a trajectory that cannot continue. We need that investment, we need that exploration, and these projects take a very long time, so we need that investment to happen now. Non-OECD countries pay about $250 billion a year in energy subsidies for their own people. That's an amount that is exactly equal of investment that's needed to meet their energy needs. So they're subsidizing things that they actually could be investing in and actually providing for a sustainable energy future for their people. We have to have a change in the way that energy is delivered to the developing country in the long term. We're also seeing an increased manipulation of natural resources around the world. This means that in certain ways they are limiting access for commercialization of resources. They're renegotiating contracts or in some cases going to the extreme of expropriating assets. They're renationalizing assets, they're cutting off supply to their neighbors, and they're subsidizing prices to offer cheap petroleum in exchange for loyalty. All of that is bad for their people and is bad for the world energy economy. We also see something that is something that's going to take a long-term commitment to change, which is a shortage of qualified staff in the energy sector. We are not graduating the scientists and the engineers around the world that are needed to carry on the next generation of technological innovation that is needed to actually solve our energy challenges over the long term. We have to solve that. It's not just an American problem, it's a worldwide problem. We also are seeing, obviously, a shortage of equipment. Rigs, drilling equipment, would be great business to be in. Uh, you can't get one to save your lives, but that will constrain the ability of companies to make the investments, the $20 trillion that are needed. Lack of investment, lack of people, long-term fix, big-time problem. So that basically leads us to sort of a new paradigm, a new construct of what we need to do and how we need to think about energy security for the future. We certainly believe that there are certain messages and certain principles that all countries, producers or consumers, need to ascribe to. And they are the following, and there are five of them. That the current level of energy insecurity in the world poses an unacceptable risk to our economies and to our security. Secondly, that the environmental challenges posed by fossil energy use must be confronted directly, immediately, and urgently. That free, open, and competitive markets for energy trade and investment are essential to increasing energy security. That innovation, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this a little bit later, is critical to solving our energy challenges and that the international nature of this problem requires coordinated action on a global scale. It does not matter what one country does alone, it matters what we do together. And that goes to the point about what's actually happening in the market. You know, the market is no longer solely driven by fundamentals. It is an emotional market, it is a psychological market. I like to remember the time when a governor in a state of Nigeria that is an oil producing state was in the UK for a visit and was arrested on on a certain charges, and immediately overnight the price of oil went up $2 because there was speculation in the market that there would be uprisings in the state in Nigeria that would shut off additional supply to the market. Completely a psychological response by the market, by the hedges, and by the traders. But that's the type of volatility in which we live, and that makes us focus on different parts of our energy policy to ensure against it, and I'll talk about some of those things in a little bit. But that's the, the, the nature of the market is very complex and unpredictable. So if you ascribe to those five principles that I just laid out, we believe that countries have to choose a more responsible path, a more responsible course of action in the immediate term. We believe that international partners, all of our international partners, producers and consumers, we don't differentiate, have to commit themselves to five major goals, as has the U.S. We strongly believe, by leading by example, in each of the five goals that I'll lay out, lay out and the messages that we have been taking to our partners around the world are things that we are leading by example and we hope can actually lead to global change. Now, there are a variety of tools in which to realize these five things that I'll lay out and you have to use all of them. Fiscal policies, regulatory policies, legislation, financial resources, changes in the way we produce and consume energy. So what's the first one that we have to do? We have to diversify the available supply of conventional fuels, and we have to expand production. Demand is not going away. It is not decreasing. We have to have additional production, and we have to have a more variety of conventional fuels. We believe the key drivers for our future energy security are twofold, investment and technology. Energy projects, as I said, are very complex. They're labor intensive. They're capital intensive. They take a long time. The investment in these projects needs to happen now. 
Here at home, we can do things with ANWR if we ever get authority from our Congress. We can expand production exploration in our outer continental shelf. We can continue to do things onshore, but that is not sufficient. We still import 60% of our energy here in the United States. The world is increasingly dependent on imported energy. We have to have more energy developed abroad. So this immense investment, as I said, has to happen now. And we need to have certain things for that investment to actually find a home. There's a lot of capital out there. It is having trouble finding a home. We need stable regulatory frameworks. We need open investment climates. We need adherence to the rule of law. And we need market-based pricing of energy resources. So the true cost of energy is being realized by the consumer. So it is not a false price of energy. Moves to restrict foreign investment and increase the reach of state-run and ill-run, in some cases, industries are limiting access to capital and to the expertise needed to unlock these resources. So what we need is not neutral stances from governments. We need governments who will actually take a proactive stance and change their policies so that they invite the investment that is needed. Initiatives, whether they're new or old, that actually control the flow of energy supplies to the market and circumvent the role of the market are actually providing a problem in the market and are contrary to the long-term interests of producers and consumers. So I've said we need clear business practices, we need stable regulatory environments. Those are basically the ingredients that will make and foment and facilitate the flow of capital, the significant capital that is needed to bring the amount of resources, whether they be hydrocarbons or others, an alternative energy, to market. What we are worried about is underinvestment. What happens if this doesn't happen? We are seeing underinvestment in places like Russia and Venezuela. We are seeing reduction in production in those countries. Russia is not going to be able to meet its contracts in natural gas over the long term if it does not turn around its investment curve. Venezuela's production, its state-owned production, is down 50 percent from where it was five years ago. That's not good for the people of Venezuela, certainly, and it's not good for the world energy market. Investment policies have to change. Governments have to think differently over the long term. It's not a political short-term goal. It's an economic long-term challenge. Secondly, we have to expand the diversity of our energy portfolio. This may seem self-evident. But what's happening around the world doesn't show that it is self-evident. We're not seeing the flow of capital around the world. We are seeing it here in the United States in some places in alternatives, and we need to expand the growth and penetration of alternative technologies. There are a lot of technologies we could talk about, but the key is, is increasing their availability and their cost competitiveness. There are a lot of alternative technologies that are available. We can produce cellulosic ethanol right now in our laboratories, but it's three times the cost of regular ethanol. Nobody right now is going to build a cellulosic ethanol plant because it's just not cost competitive. So from the federal side, and a role that the federal government should play, is in a place where the private sector and capital markets can't play, is buying down the costs of these technologies so they actually become cost competitive and then will be able to be more available to the marketplace. And that really is the core of, of President Bush's two recent proposals, the Advanced Energy Initiative, which seeks to invest in those technologies that we believe will have the most near-term commercial competitiveness in solar, in wind, in nuclear, in clean coal, uh, and others that we think uh, within a relatively understandable time horizon will make it to market and will be able to compete and be able to actually have the diversity that we need to achieve in our energy sector. If you're an investment banker in New York, you don't just put all your money in, 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 in one fund. And certainly, as an energy consumer, we shouldn't have all of our energy consumption in one area. We need alternatives. That's good for us, it's good for the market, and it certainly is good for the economy. The President also proposed his 20 and 10 initiative in his State of the Union uh, this past year, which seeks to reduce America's consumption of gasoline by 20 percent through a greater reliance on alternative fuels and increased fuel efficiency. Now, many have said, is this a hostile policy against our producers? The answer is no. Demand is going up, it is going up around the world, and we need more energy. We need more hydrocarbons, we need more solar, we need more wind, we need more ethanol, we need more biodiesel, we need more of everything. And it is for the greater good of the energy security of the world that we will invest in having a broader, diverse supply of energy. To my point earlier about different types of policy instruments, you know, we have really taken advantage of some of the things in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which we hope will provide an example for other countries around the world. For example, 
uh, Secretary of Energy Sam Bodman and his counterpart at the Treasury, Hank Paulson, recently awarded a billion dollars in tax incentives for nine new clean coal facilities, and we're going to award another $650 million this year. We're trying to get to that space in the market and that the private sector won't go and the federal research dollars have already been exhausted. We know the technology works, but we just can't get it out into the marketplace, so how can we close that gap? And so we're looking at innovative financing that the government can provide on a concessionary basis that will help to continue to close that gap. Obviously, in the power sector, we need uh, an increased use of nuclear and renewable electricity generation. Not only is this good for energy security, but it's good for environmental security. And it's good for ad addressing the growth of greenhouse gases. I have to tell you that the President feels very strongly, and I think leaders around the world are increasingly of this belief as well, some more than others, that we are in the process of and must have a nuclear renaissance around the world. In order to meet that electricity demand growth that I referenced in the beginning, we're going to have to have new nuclear power if we're going to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. There is no other option. Fusion is many years down the road. Long-term things are down the road. We need new nuclear power now. We've invested in those new technologies. We have a new partnership with Russia, France, Japan, China and several other countries to bring nuclear power to the developing world so they will have access to emissions-free technology and we will take back uh, the spent fuel so that actually it becomes a proliferation resistant provision of nuclear power. And this is the type of innovation, the type of thinking outside the box that compels us these days in the market at which we find ourselves. We need nuclear power and not every country, it's not desirable to have every country produce an, uh, the type of nuclear power that we need. That is a an attraction for people to actually misuse fissile material. We need to find ways around that. We have to look at ways to invest in ITER, uh, which will look to the long term to solving the fusion challenge. So it's collaboration amongst countries that will really prove to be fundamental in the long term. Third, we have to promote energy efficiency. The next best source of energy is the one we currently waste. I know all the folks that have worked for uh, and with the Department of Energy are laughing at the moment because I say this all the time and we strongly believe it. The next best source of energy is the one we currently waste. We are still lacking in energy efficiency gains in this country. We've made tremendous progress. There's tremendous progress to be made and there's even more progress to be made in the industrialized world. As they climb up the economic curve, it's in our interest to make sure they do it in an energy efficient manner and to help them have access to the technologies that will uh, provide them uh, that opportunity at a cost competitive rate. One of the meetings that we had recently was when uh, the EU and the U.S. have their annual summit and out of it com came a communique uh, and we had the same outcome in a communique between us and China where we have agreed with the EU and with China to find ways either within or should Doha not succeed and we all are hoping it does to find ways to reduce or if appropriate eliminate tariffs on clean energy goods and services. We are only shooting ourselves in the foot if we are putting additional prices on clean energy goods and services. We need to reduce those so that they are, again, more cost competitive, and that will lead to better energy efficiency around the world. By leading by example, we here in the United States, or certainly we have a broad array, a broad array of tax incentives, uh, and some of them were recently renewed uh, for production of, of energy efficient uh, technologies and, and energy and power, but also we have uh, and will be over the next five years publishing 23 new appliance standards, which will basically completely transform the whole manufacturing of household appliances and industrial appliances to be far more energy efficient. We also have a voluntary program, which many of you are familiar with. You go to Home Depot or any place else where you buy your appliances, you see the Energy Star sticker. You know, the Energy Star sticker, while it's a voluntary program, I just think it's important for people to realize this is, uh, this voluntary measures actually have a huge impact. Last year alone, Energy Star appliances that were sold saved 150 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, or if you equate that uh, in dollar terms, $12 billion of savings on electric bills. This was not a government mandate. It was a voluntary program that manufacturers and consumers have come together to believe in. So we can have mandates. We can have voluntary programs. We can have fiscal incentives. You need them all. There's not a one-size-fits-all. I think nations have to remember that. There's not a cookie-cutter approach. We can't decide in Brussels, in St. Petersburg, or in Tokyo what is good for the rest of the world. We certainly can't decide it in Washington. We have to allow countries to decide according to their own national circumstances how to achieve national and economic and energy security. But these principles are fundamental. 
Next, we have to improve the Earth's environment to reduce pollution, and we have to do it to improve our environmental stewardship, and we have to do it in a more expedited manner. Let me just say a word about what the President said here before he went off to the G8. I think he issued uh, an extraordinary opportunity and challenge to the developed and developing world when he said, I would like to convene a meeting of the largest economies, the largest emitters, this fall to find a way to get a post-2012 framework in place, a post-Kyoto framework in place by the end of next year. That means that we could actually have an agreement amongst 15 or so countries about how to move forward. The 15 or so countries, however it ends up, you know, whatever the composition of the 15 is, will comprise roughly 90 percent of the world's emissions. If those countries can agree, and the accomplishment that that will be for the future will be enormous. Again, each country has to do it according to its national circumstances. They have different population growth. They have different urban uh, profiles. Some are more rural in nature, some are more urban. All of these trends have to be taken into account. But if each country establishes a program and then is reviewed by those other 15 peers on a yearly basis to see if they are adhering to the programs and the goals they have set out, it will be a very, very powerful step forward in addressing global climate change. And here in the United States, we don't ever get credit for what we're doing on climate change. The only thing we get credit for is not signing Kyoto. And I'd like to say that, you know, we have invested $37 billion in clean energy technology since 2001. That's more than any nation or group of nations has, period, ever. And we're not slacking off. It's only going up. We're going to use technology to crack this code. We're not going to put mandatory, arbitrary limits on our economy that will force our jobs somewhere else than here. Bottom line. You know, the President put out a goal in, 20, in 2002 to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions intensity by 18 percent by 2012. And I'm happy to say not only are we on target, but we are ahead of our target. In fact, uh, our greenhouse gas intensity declined by 2.5 percent in 2005. So we're very pleased with the progress that we are making. The final goal is that we have to maintain a global energy supply system and we have to protect our critical energy infrastructure to ensure against this volatile market in which we find ourselves. I mean, delivering energy resources is as important as finding them. Governments have a responsibility in that regard. So does the private sector, but we have a shared responsibility in ensuring that. We in the United States have proposed a doubling of our strategic petroleum reserve. And people say, well, aren't you talking out of both sides of your mouth? If you're talking alternatives, why are you uh, also expanding your strategic petroleum reserve? Because we are going to be relying on hydrocarbons for some time. And as demand grows, goes up, the only sure fire immediate access we have to additional supply is our strategic petroleum reserve. We need it, and we want to expand it. And the world has to be prepared to do it as well. At the International Energy Agency, there are 26 nations that have a strategic petroleum reserve-like mechanism, but countries like India and China, big consumers, are just beginning efforts in this, in this regard. And we need to encourage them to accelerate their efforts so that if there is some type of international big supply disruption, that these big consuming nations are not left vulnerable. That's not in our interest to see China vulnerable. It's not in our interest to see India vulnerable. It's in our interest to see a smooth energy economy, and that requires everybody to take an appropriate stake in that economy, an appropriate responsible stake in that economy. So if you look at those five goals, if we agree on those goals, I think, and we think, and what we have challenged the people around the world that we are talking to, it defines a new coalition of countries and a new paradigm for energy security. An energy security that's defined by secure supply, environmental responsibility, and a new technological approach to energy security. So, to what I was actually asked to talk about, where have we been delivering this message? What types of fora have we actually been talking to and through? I mentioned the IEA. The IEA, uh, uh, the member countries of the IEA that's headquartered uh, in Paris, has a ministerial every two years. And uh, our secretary, Sam Bodman, led the delegation uh, in the middle of May. And they talked about the – they got together two years ago, and it's a much different energy market in which we find ourselves now. We've got high prices. Uh, we've got increasingly geopolitical risks. If you look at just Nigeria alone, we've got 750,000 barrels of oil offline in Nigeria. Uh, we are looking at uh, sustainability issues that we did not face two years ago. So a very different energy market for these energy ministers to actually get together and talk about. 
But they really came away with three conclusions, and I think you'll find them similar to what I just talked about. Number one, we need to sharpen and strengthen our emergency response mechanisms. We need to be prepared as consuming nations, this organization uh, represents consuming nations, in case there is a supply disruption, in case another governor in Nigeria, or if two governors in Nigeria get arrested, what are we going to do if another 750,000 barrels is offline from Nigeria? We need to look and evaluate countries' progress in energy efficiency. We need to evaluate each other. Are you actually living up? Are you being a responsible stakeholder in the international energy market? Pledge and review, peer review. And they stress the need to accelerate the development and deployment of new technologies. Of course, that's something that we strongly believe in. So those three things, those principal outcomes, are outcomes that we have in the, long, in the, in the early part of this actually challenged the world to adopt as principal tenets to pursue for long-term energy security. So I'm glad that these sound familiar. However, as I said before, there's not a prescription. There's not a cookie-cutter approach to this. All nations will do it according to their own terms and their national circumstances, recognizing differing economies, uh, differing populations, etc. We then left Paris and came back through here and then went off to Darwin, Australia, which is truly as far away from here as you can possibly get. Once you get to Australia and you think, well, I've already flown for 20-some-odd hours, I have to be there. Well, no, you have another 15 to go. Uh, but in Darwin, Australia, which is truly in the outback, uh, the ministers met uh, again and reached four principal conclusions. And forgive me, they sound a little bit familiar with the ones that I just laid out, but they believe that we need a diversified mix of energy efficiency measures, we need clean coal generation, nuclear power, and renewable energy. We need a balanced approach to oil security, which includes and is reliant upon fair and transparent investment regimes. We need to improve fuel efficiency in the transport sector. And lastly, we have to in use, increase the use of biofuels to reduce, in this case, uh, the Asia-Pacific region's dependence on hydrocarbons over time. And in that regard, the U.S. actually leads the APEC uh, Biofuels Task Force. And it was tasked with looking at, in a far more detailed level, level of granularity about the prospects for alternative feedstocks for biofuels in all parts of the Asia-Pacific region, and we will do that. Then we went off to the Hillingen Dam uh, in Germany for the G8 summit. And, you know, the G8 summit had a very lengthy communique. I will not go through all the tenets of the communique on energy and the environment, except for to say a couple of things. It was prominent. It was discussed extensively in all of the lead-up meetings. It was discussed extensively by the leaders. There was a great deal of difference of opinion, and at the end of the day, there was a consensus. Uh, and the consensus is what's remarkable, because we came at it fighting about degrees on global climate change. And we came away with saying, we've got to dispense with this argument. We've got to get on with action. And I think that's the important message, is that we are going to continue. Countries are going to differ, but we can either continue to argue about these types of things, or we can commit to a course of action that will address climate change. We have chosen the course of action and are leaving the debate behind. And I think that the countries at the G8 and the other countries that were there, the five, uh, and others have joined that thinking that it is time to put this to bed and to look forward about what we're going to do about it. So the G8 statement endorsed the President's uh, proposal. They said we'd like to convene this meeting, find a way forward by the end of 2008 for a new Kyoto framework. We believe in the power of technology. We believe in nation sovereignty and their ability to actually make the right choices. And we believe that the, the statement by the G8 that climate change is a global challenge that requires all countries in some way to participate is very important. We have to have China and India at the table if we're ever going to make a meaningful dent in climate change. And while they may be on different trajectories, uh, they cannot be exempt from this new architecture. And we will be working very, very hard uh, not only between now and the fall when we have this meeting, but between now and 2008, to find a way to bring them into this tent that does not hamper their economic growth, but actually lets them excel, industrialize, but not at the expense of the world's environment. I want to spend a minute or two on China, and then I just want to tell you the meetings are on the horizon since they haven't happened yet. I don't know what will happen, but I could, I could uh, make some, uh, well, I won't. But engagement with China. Um, Two things have happened uh, recently with China. Number one, they have really decided that they need to play a bigger role in the economy. 
they are playing a bigger role, but they want to have a bigger voice in the economy. And through a new strategic economic dialogue between the U.S. and China, we're saying yes, but with that comes responsibility. If you want to have that voice at the table, you also have to do things that demonstrate to the world that you are a responsible stakeholder of the economy. The energy part of it I'll get to in a minute. And that there's currency issues, there's IPR issues, there are all kinds of issues. But the fact that we're actually sitting down and talking to the leadership of China, they brought 15 ministers here. Uh, you know, that's it's an extraordinary, uh, it's an extraordinary airlift operation to begin with. But to have them all here and half of the lead, more than half of the leadership of China sitting across the table from our cabinet, you know, for a solid two days, really getting into details about challenges uh, and how we deal with things, how we are dealing with pension reform, how we are dealing with an aging population, how we are dealing with some of these issues, the challenges that they see, the different approaches that they're taking is extraordinarily healthy. It shows where we have common purpose. It shows where we don't. It is bringing together two incredibly powerful nations that are seeking to find common strains and common approaches to things, and also an understanding where we don't. And there are things that we will never agree on. But at least if we understand what they're doing, it makes it a safer economy and a safer world. On, uh, on energy, uh, we agreed to several things that if you didn't read the uh, fairly hard to read uh, communique that came out of it, I don't blame you. I'll summarize it for you of the things that we agreed to this time. These meetings happen every six months, by the way. So in December of this year, uh, everybody will be getting on our own airlift and, and going back over to, to China as we did six months previous. So this is uh, a regularized uh, institutional meeting now, which I think will bear fruit over the long term, which is what it is about. It is not about immediate deliverables. You know, we signed this MOU, that MOU, that MOU. It's about trying to find over the long term ways that we can address our challenges together. And in the area of energy, uh, I mentioned the WTO uh, earlier, and China and the U.S. have agreed to really take an active leadership within the WTO to address the tariff barriers to clean energy goods and services. And I think that's an important breakthrough that we'll be standing uh, linked at the arm uh, to address that together. We've also agreed to increase our cooperation on clean coal technology research. We are heavily reliant on coal. We have abundant sources of coal, and so does China. China builds one coal fire power plant a week, and that's increasing. It's in our interest to make sure that they are built in a more energy efficient manner, and they're not right now necessarily being built that way because it is too expensive. So we're investing together uh, in a very large project uh, in clean coal technology that will be cited here in the United States. We've also agreed to cooperate and help them build 15 large coal mine methane capture projects. And we're looking at ways to actually help them reduce some cost barriers uh, to clean coal in their country. We also signed a memorandum of, of understanding, despite what I just said, uh, on nuclear safety because uh, China has the biggest expansion of nuclear power going on in the world. And it is in our interest to make sure that it's done in a very safe manner. There is a lot to be learned from our Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, we have already pre-certified a number of designs, one of which they have bought, China has bought. Uh, and we feel very, very committed to helping them expand their power sector in nuclear power, but in a safe, uh, in a safe manner. And lastly, you know, the, the backbone of the Chinese economy is on their industry. And they have an industry that is motivated by profit, not like any other country. Uh, and that means cutting costs and not being as energy efficient in using the highest technology that is available. So we are going to be training a core of people in China to actually go out and do energy efficiency audits at these industries. They've, they've identified a thousand of their most, um, of their biggest industries and go in and say, here's where you could be saving energy. And let's translate that into dollars. Here's how much that, that particular facility or industry, industrial site, would actually save. We do it here in the United States. We've completed 200 of those, and we're going to help China actually develop a similar program so they can do it. If, it. if it results in profit savings, that's good for them. If it results in environmental savings, that's good for us. So we see it as a win-win. I'm going off to uh, the west coast of California in September because we have regular energy dialogues uh, with China. We'll be holding uh, the third such meeting uh, in San Francisco in the middle of September where we can really get into energy efficiency uh, in a far more detail than you can when you have two cabinet ministers and delegations talking to each other and really looking at that uh, as an investment in our collective futures and environmental futures. 
So on the horizon, uh, let me tell you a couple of things that are coming up, and then I'll be quiet. Um, next week, I head off to Nigeria. Nigeria is the United States' fourth largest energy supplier now. And as I mentioned, they have a tremendous amount of oil offline. We'd like to have much more detailed discussions with Nigeria about some of the problems, talk with some of the companies, uh, and to try and, uh, over the short and medium and long term, uh, find a way back to regularized uh, supply from Nigeria, not just for us, but for the global market. The global market is, ca is, is figuring in a price for this offline capacity, so it's in everybody's interest uh, to get that capacity online and the security situation under control. Uh, we'll be heading off to India in October for a ministerial level meeting on the Asia-Pacific Partnership, which was, uh, it's, a, it's a group of six nations, the U.S. being one of them, uh, China, Japan, India, and South Korea, I think I got them all, uh, Australia, uh, will be meeting to talk about clean development and climate. How can we actually do the energy security thing in the climate context? We've already had one ministerial at this level, and we have eight working groups on this that are populated by the private sector, not by government bureaucrats that give speeches and sign MOUs, by people that are actually putting their dollars into the ground. What is it that they can tell us we need to do, and where are they willing to invest, and how can we do things to get out of the way or facilitate their investment in these clean energy projects? Uh, we'll be heading off in September to Vienna. The uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has their annual meeting, and on the margins of that, uh, that partnership that I mentioned to you, the nuclear partnership between uh, Russia and France and uh, ourselves and China and Japan, and there'll be more countries invited to supplier nations like Canada, Australia, and others, uh, will be there so that we can further discuss how we're going to, over the long term, solve the challenges to expanding nuclear power to the developing world in a proliferation-resistant manner. The UN Secretary General is having a meeting in New York on climate change in September as well, and so that will be populated by ministers of all levels, uh, and that's a very important meeting of a broad set of nations to talk about in a UN uh, setting uh, what people are prepared to do as they embark upon uh, the next set of discussions under the UN Framework Convention, which will take place in December in Bali. As I mentioned, the President himself is having, uh, and we are having, the administration is having a meeting of the large emitters large economies uh, here in the fall. So it will happen before Bali, but probably after the Secretary General meeting. Three more. I'm earning my frequent flyer miles. Um, Japan is hosting the G8 next year, uh, and they too believe that energy needs to be a fundamental part of the G8 agenda. They're going to host an energy minister's meeting, and they're also going to host what they call a five-party meeting, which is a different set of nations. It's the five largest energy consumers. Uh, and those don't necessarily, uh, they aren't represented in the G8. And so we'll be getting the, the G8 ministers and the largest consuming uh, countries together. Uh, and I think that will be very interesting because that will happen right in the midst of the very heated, I'll say it, climate debate. It will happen at a time where there is a tremendous amount of decisions being made about energy policy. And so that will be two very important meetings. And lastly, then that will flow right into the largest meeting on energy that happens every couple of years, which is the, the meeting between energy producers and consumers at the International Energy Forum, which is being held uh, in Italy this year. And that will be sort of the culmination of the next eight months of meetings. I'm sure there's going to be eight or ten that are called in the interim that I'm not even aware of yet, but those are the ones that are at least on the radar screen. So, you know, there's lots of opportunity to advance our message. I don't think there's any problem with our message. I, as I said in the beginning, it's not about words, it's about action. And we are working very hard to make known how we are achieving and the tools that we are putting in effect to actually have demonstrable progress on those five principles, using all the tools that are in our toolbox and bringing the private sector into the discussion, into the table, uh, into the decision-making process very early on, because ultimately, uh, the, the progress of this will be borne on the backs of the private sector, not on the backs of government and government's bureaucracies. So we recognize there's no silver bullet, not either in a technology or a policy. We need all of them. We need all the technologies. We need all the policies. Government can't do it alone. The private sector can't do it alone. We have to do it together. But it depends upon the world opening their markets, embracing new technologies and new practices to ensure a secure and peaceful energy future. I think the, the basic fundamental question that I'll leave with you regarding the energy challenges, whether these investments will be made to unlock those resources, and beyond that, will we be willing to make the investments necessary to make sure the innovation cycle continues? 
Will we have the investments and will we have the people to carry forward? Will we be able to actually meet that energy challenge with those advanced technologies? Thank you. Karen is one who uh, certainly appreciates the prerogative of the speaker to change around the topics. I had every confidence that you would get back to the issues, and it sounds like you've been busy. Um, let me just start with a, with a question on the domestic side. The, the politics of energy legislation so quickly after the 2005 energy bill, but the changing landscape. How has that changed both the focus of what the administration wants to accomplish and what do you think the prospects are given the fact that we're getting into a heated presidential election cycle? You know, I think there's, there's a good news story in this. And the good news story is that everybody has elevated energy to the top of their political agendas. And that's a good thing. That means that people recognize that this is a fundamental challenge that we need to, in a bipartisan manner, get together and find some solutions. The challenge remains is whether we can find the bipartisan solution. Uh, you know, in this town, unless you have a energy bill platform or idea, uh, you're not part of the discussion. And so there are a tremendous amount of ideas, a lot of pieces of legislation on any given bill. There are hundreds of amendments uh, which are being put forward, and there's some very good pieces of legislation. We happen to favor the ones that the administration has put forward. Uh, but we certainly find elements of the things that we believe in in a lot of different pieces of legislation. We also find some out there that are very, very objectionable for a variety of reasons. Ones that would hurt our economy, would hurt our energy security, would do demonstrable damage to our manufacturing sector, would hurt our relations with other countries, would actually adversely affect the price environment here in the United States, would jack up prices. And so we have to be very careful that in the rush to do something about energy, that we don't do something that actually has an adverse reaction. And so we have been trying to, at every possible point in this, in this discussion, to explain the implications of some of the legislation that's put out. You know, I'm not a health care specialist. Uh, and there's people up on Capitol Hill that are not energy specialists, and that's okay. But those of us that happen to know a little bit about energy uh, appreciate the opportunity to explain to them the implications about uh, some of this legislation that in the short and long term may have. And so I think it will be uh, a long uh, discussion through the fall. I do think we'll see some legislation, uh, but I do think that uh, the, you know, this administration is fairly adamant about certain pieces of legislation and have made known so in, uh, and have issued uh, their strong thoughts uh, and thoughts about vetoes on particular pieces of legislation for which we find very distasteful and, quite frankly, to be very harmful to our economy, both here and abroad, and to our investors abroad. Excellent idea. Let me open it up to the floor. We have two simple rules here. Um, the first is that you identify yourself and wait for the microphone. And the second is to the extent that you can pose a question in the form of a question. That would be extremely helpful. Right, let's start in the back. Rob, go ahead. Rob Bradley from the World Resources Institute. I wanted to touch on the on the climate policy aspect of what you were discussing, and it was certainly very interesting to uh, hear President Bush's proposal to bring together um, you know, some of the major emitting economies, including not only the industrialized countries, but also countries such as Russia, India, China, and so on. Uh, possibly he got the idea in part because he was currently standing in a meeting of the major emitting economies, including all the industrialized countries, China, Russia, India, and so on. Um, Given that the G8 plus 5 process doesn't seem to have generated a big piece of movement on that, and given that uh, the UNFCCC processes, where all those same countries are also present, doesn't seem to have generated a lot of motion, um, what are your thoughts on how the, process, the sort of process that, that President Bush was getting at is going to somehow break that logjam? What is it that's new that you're thinking you can inject into that discussion? Happy to. Um, you know, we have a couple of beliefs. Number one is that you know, this is not going to be a U.S. decided operation, uh, and that there has not been a concerted effort with singular purpose with all of these countries and the appropriate officials at the table to have this discussion with the sole, the sole goal of finding a post-2012 Kyoto framework under which we can all live and under which we can actually utilize technology and which will not hurt economic growth. And a framework will actually include the industrializing countries. And so I think it is a different construct. It is one that has singular purpose. 
It has one that has significant momentum. We have talked to all of the economies. They are all in favor of this. And I don't think you've seen that level of agreement before. And so I think this is a time where we need to capitalize on that agreement, use it to propel significant momentum so that we can get something done and will feed into the UN process by the end of 2009. If you remember that these emitting economies represent 90% of greenhouse gas emissions, if we can agree on something, then I think that we can actually reach agreement with the rest of the 180 nations represented in the UNFCCC. Andrzej Zwaniecki, US Info. I have a follow-up to the previous question, which is uh, more specifically about the Asia-Pacific uh, partnership. Uh, when it was announced last year, it was perceived by many as a uh, voluntary uh, alternative to Kyoto Protocol involving big emitters uh, in contrast to Kyoto, which didn't uh, involve in any significant, uh, meaningful way uh, India and China. And I wonder, in the in, the, in light of what happened at the G8, the recent summit, and the uh, proposed uh, uh, dialogue between big emitters, how does APD uh, fit in the new or broader strategy, strategy now? You know, I think APP has been a very strong foundation and will provide us some excellent building blocks. You know, it is clear that uh, we cannot solve this problem simply by talking government to government, that we have to have a way to bring industry and private sector into the discussion. The APP, uh, when it was formed and is still to its core today, is a partnership between government and the private sector and industry. And that is what makes APP so different from any other initiative out there as we sit next to each other uh, in all of these meetings and trying to find common solutions to problems that actually will not uh, you know, actually put businesses out of business, will actually facilitate investments to expand their businesses in clean energy and in sustainable development and in parts of the world in which they previously had been unwilling to invest because of tariff barriers or other regulatory barriers, that when you have the government at the table and they recognize that there is capital that is willing to do this and do it in for things that are have environmental benefit, that they actually are then compelled to do something about it. So I think there are some very strong building blocks I don't see as one being thrown out because we're going in another direction. I see them as coexisting because the, the, the APP can continue to go on because it is a very useful construct to achieve what we're seeing now is we have something like 180 projects in the pipeline to actually get built uh, and invested in through the APP. That is something that no one would want to abandon. I mean, over time, in any of these things, it would be useful if the government part of this could actually just fade away because there would be no need for the government component of this, that the private sector and the flow of capital and these projects would naturally happen. The reason we're there is because it's not happening, and there's reasons it's not happening. We're investing in bringing down the cost of the technologies, but we need the other part of the market to actually cooperate, which is are we posing unnecessary barriers to that capital? I think that's why we've got the two parties at the table uh, so that we can have a more rational and real-time conversation about what we need to do. Do you get a sense that as, as the players change, as the market changes, as the leverage changes, that, that the old institutions that maybe we're looking at, you know, coalitions of the interested to go forward on bigger issues to get things going? It's you know, the, the, the architecture of the energy sector is changing. Uh, and there are different players that have certainly a very big role uh, that didn't before. Uh, and they're sort of invisible to the market. Uh, and that's, that provides the, the volatility in the market that's hard for us to understand. And I don't want to say that I'm putting the whole back of volatility on uh, traders and speculators because I'm not, but they are adding to it uh, with no doubt. And the other institutions that are out there, I mean, the IEA, which was dedicated to uh, a certain issue when it was formed uh, after the Arab oil embargo, uh, is there just for that purpose and has grown over time to accommodate other parts of energy policy, and is that the right architecture? Uh, and I think it's a valid question as we move forward and as, uh, as you know, we laid out those five principles and, and energy security was but one of them. Energy efficiency is another. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there that we need to be looking at. One of the interesting challenges that we have is on the technological challenge. You know, we do a lot of international cooperation, but when you look at it, we don't have the same institutional infrastructure across the table, across the ocean. Uh, that we do here. We have 24 national laboratories 
that are investing in research to actually bring advanced clean energy technologies to market. When you go and talk to the EU, they don't have one. So how do you do that joint research? How do you have that energy cooperation? So uh, we have to find some way to balance the cooperation uh, over the long term to make it a more shared uh, enterprise. Uh, Tamiyo Masta uh, from Tokyo Electric Power Company. And at the GS summit, uh, Japanese Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Abe, uh, proposed uh, some uh, uh, strategy by Japanese government for uh, climate change issues, uh, uh, especially for about 50% uh, uh, decrease of CO2 by 2050 and so on. How do you evaluate his proposal? No, and in the G8 uh, summit de declaration that came out, it says that all the countries will, will give uh, consideration to the proposals put forward by Japan, uh, by Canada, and others. Very, very well acquainted with uh, Prime Minister Abe's proposal. We've been very fortunate to have three meetings over the last several months uh, with the minister uh, uh, from uh, Japan and a variety of places here and in other places where we have been. Uh, to talk in further detail about this proposal. Uh, one of the things that we have said and believe uh, is that we don't want to decide the outcome before we have some of the discussions. And that we believe having a meeting amongst the major economies and the major emitters where we can look at everybody's thoughts, everybody's uh, proposals on the table will lead to a better consensus over time. So we have tried to say we, we're, it's not that we're against it, it's not we're for it, let's have the discussion and find out where the whole landscape is and where everybody is feeling and find and, and attain that aspirational goal and let's work towards it and let's have a system where we actually pledge and review. Let's find a way that we can actually look to the other economies and say you either are or are not meeting the goal that you've set out to get the world to 50, 40, 60, whatever it might be. So we have, uh, we've reserved the space to have the discussion in the fall amongst these countries so that there is a consensual goal. We'll start up here on the front and then we'll swing around the side. Hi, my name is Paul Lois. I'm with the Arlington Institute. And it sounds like there's a real sense of urgency about some kind of global energy policy and the, the three drivers would be maintaining economic growth, security, and climate change. But could you speak about, I guess, the relative importance if those are really the three big drivers? I suppose well, what, what I'm getting at is um, how, do people really care about climate change or is it just, are people just talking about it? Well, I have to say that I, I can't judge. I mean, there's been lots of polls that have been done recently on, uh, at least in the United States, about the public concern about it. And then uh, you get high level of concern. And then when you talk about how much people are willing to pay for it, and then it's zero. And so we have very conflicting public data. And I think uh, we try not to run government by polling. And we have to do what we think is right. We know a couple of things. The energy security and environmental security over the long term are inextricably intertwined. And so we can't do one. Uh, solely without, with t complete disregard for the other. Uh, we do have to continue to grow our economy. So we have a fundamental need to expand our access to hydrocarbons and alternative sources of energy. At the same time, we have a very strong belief that we have to do more for the environment. So we are looking for that sweet spot, if you will, where we can continue to do both. That's why, you know, we are, and you are, because you're the taxpayers, are investing in clean energy technology so we can make those breakthroughs, that so we'll be actually having the ability to have the kinds of energy uh, out there that we don't even realize are available to us today. So I don't think you should say it's energy security first, environment second, or vice versa. It's that you have to take them both together. And we have to find a way that we can continue to expand, improve, enhance, not just our energy security, but the world's energy security, while doing it in a way that is environmentally responsible. Because if we do it one at the expense of the other, the costs are too great over the long term. And I think we are seeing a very big opportunity right now in the industrializing world, in the developing world, if you will, as they have a much higher, higher economic growth rate than many places in the world, uh, if we avail ourselves of all sorts of parts of our innovation chain and have advanced technologies take hold, so they leapfrog over 
uh, what us, what our economy went through uh, when we were industrializing. There were no options. There was no clean coal technology. We had coal technology. Well, now there is. So why would we want them to use the, while well, it's cheaper, the dirtier technology that actually is having a, a, a negative impact on the environment when there is that technology out there, albeit more expensive? So we're trying to make that technology less expensive and finding those barriers that are making it uh, expensive, not just research and development related. So I think we continue to look for the sweet spot, knowing there's no, there's no magic bullet, but there are sweet spots. This wasn't prescriptive, but as part of the National Petroleum Council study, we, we've constructed the same type of triangle. So nice work. All right. Okay. Please go ahead. Thomas Bikan, Embassy of Slovakia. I would like to ask you, uh, what is your take on the theory of uh, peak oil? When do you think it will happen, actually? And <laughs> what are the measures you are preparing, main measures, actually, you are preparing to fill the gap, eventual gap? You know, whatever date, year, decade I picked, I'd be wrong. Uh, the National Petroleum Council uh, is undertaking a study to see what we think uh, is really the true nature of supply out there and what we think is the true nature of demand and what does that mean for uh, recommendations for policymakers. I do think there's one thing we know for sure, that hydrocarbons won't be here for eternity. Uh, and so it's in our interest to elongate the time that they're here. And that means providing an additional diversity into the market. It does not mean that we decided that we don't want hydrocarbons anymore, that we're going to do something else, that we need a, a bigger, better, more diverse, more rich, more robust landscape. And that's what our energy policy seeks to do. It's not one or the other. And, and I think that uh, you know, even uh, people out there that, are, uh, that believe that peak oil is right around the corner uh, have no argument with our energy policy. And people that believe peak oil is very far out uh, have no argument with our pursuit uh, of, of our energy policy. So uh, it's, you have to be prudent, uh, but I don't think that, if you look at the amount of, uh, of investment that I, I referenced earlier of $20 trillion, we know that there's significant resources out there and reserves out there that are not being developed right now. I think the risk is not that we're going to find peak oil. The risk is that we're not going to actually invest the dollars to get the resources that we know that are there right now out of the ground. So I think we have to take this in digestible bites. We have to invest in alternatives. We have to get the resources that are out of the ground, and we have to continue to find ways to do it that do not jeopardize over the long term our environment. You want to say a word about the NPC study if you, if you have to? <laughs> We're coming at it from the same way. I, I think that the, the study will be out next Wednesday, so I'm not previewing it by any stretch of the imagination. But I think the sense of the group, and it's 350 people, maybe 1,000, up to 1,000 that were involved in this thing, that the resource endowment in the globe is, is enormous. It's enough to sustain us. It's trillions of barrels of oil equivalent. There's the same concern, though, that the above ground issues, and that's everything from access to governance to security to environmental sensitivity, um, investment, infrastructure. These are the things that may prohibit you from getting there when you need to, and those are the things we need to work on. Hi, my name is Eli Gansner. I'm a business school student from the University of Navarra in Spain. And uh, I was just wondering, since 2000, if you could give a rough idea of the percentage uh, breakdown of all government investment, be it in subsidies or in direct investment, into the various sources of energy, and what would be the <laughs> general rationale behind that? I mean, just ballpark figures uh, oh, sure. where money can go. <laughs> Let me get out my pocket card. Um, well, a, a couple of things. Um, and actually, uh, uh, without punting, I will tell you that, um, that OMB does pull this together. And if you looked on the OMB website, they actually calculate all the different parts across the government. But it's if you the rationale, the rationale, okay. Well, well, let me let me just give you a couple of figures that that might help put it in context. Uh, at the Department of Energy, on an annual basis, we spend twenty four billion dollars. Half of that, roughly, is in non proliferation matters, and the other twelve is roughly. Uh, in science, basic science. Keep in mind that the, the Department of Energy, the U.S. government, forget that's our department, the United States government is the largest funder of science, research science in the world. So you've got that part, of, I mean, uh, in the world uh, by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, well, by billions of dollars, let me just put it that way. And then the other part of it is into the energy security and the research and development of other technologies. 
so we have it split. We have a split mission, and so I'll take the half of it off the table because I don't really think that's, that that's your concern. What we are looking for is a balanced approach to short-term, medium-term, and long-term. And that means that we are looking in the short term at those technologies we think are going to be nearest to market. And if they're nearest to market, then they might just need either a technological push or you go to the other side of the curve, you actually might need that loan guarantee, that tax incentive that actually buys down the cost of the capital getting out to the market. So you make that judgment in the short term. Is it a technological risk that we're buying down? If it is, then we need to put some money into R&D. If it is something else, there's a capital market misunderstanding about it, that we actually need to buy that down. That pushes us into the other side of the equation and a fiscal incentive. As I said, whether it's a tax incentive, production tax credit, a loan guarantee, something that will make it more cost competitive or whether it be competitive for capital. Two very different issues there. Then you get higher up the curve, which is a medium term, uh, and that is where we're bringing in joint research with the private sector. We think there's something that really has true market potential. We believe we would be benefit we would benefit from joint research with the private sector, so it will accelerate its uptake into the market. So they're sitting with us in the laboratory. We're with DuPont or we're with the University of Navarro in Spain. We're saying doing this research so that it will actually be taken out into the market. And there's things that are long term, and, and that's cost shared. That's not free. We're not paying for DuPont to be sitting with us. DuPont is paying its own uh, dime to be sitting there. So it's, it's a cost split between us and the private sector. So that's the medium term side of things. And over the long term, it's things where we believe that there is a significant opportunity, but we have no idea whether it will work or not. And that's solely on the federal dime. And those are things that might be hydrogen, fusion, longer term things. There may be private sector involvement in there, but it's normally on a grant basis or a cooperative agreement basis where we are subsidizing, if you will, their research because there is no in the medium term, long term, short term profit motivation for this uh, investment to be made by the private sector. So you're looking at, you never want to, uh, you know, we're not smarter than the private sector. I mean, the backbone of this country is built on innovation and entrepreneurs. And so we're very, very careful of that space. We want to take up the space where there's either not the appetite, the risk, or the capability. And that goes on a sliding scale up depending on the horizon of the technology. And the closer it is to market, it's also f taking advantage of our other policy instruments, whether they be fiscal, loan guarantees, regulatory, et cetera. I hope that helps. Okay, let me start back on this one. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chinadu. I want to ask you what changes have you noticed with countries that have partnered with you in terms of investment? in developing better technologies for clean energy? Well, that's a really good question. We have a belief uh, that um, you know, we are accelerating the innovation chain here and abroad when we do that. How you quantify that is very, very difficult. If you look at ethanol as an example, uh, we cooperate with a lot of countries, but it ended up being because we cracked the code here and we had a regulatory uh, demand, a, a mandate of the amount of ethanol that, or, or alternative energy fuel, alternative fuel that had to be introduced into our system that really propelled uh, the United States to produce significantly more ethanol in the last couple of years. Uh, we are now posed to actually surpass the, the mandate that we were given in 2005. Um, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. In the area of nuclear, I think there has been tremendous benefit for all of the countries involved in joint research. Over the long term, there are going to be big research projects that no country, including the United States, even with our big economy, are going to be able to afford to do by themselves. Uh, clean coal capture and storage, sequestration, big, big ticket things that have broad application. It's incumbent upon all of us to do the research together and share the results. Uh, and that's uh, something that we're doing in the, the coal project that I mentioned. And there'll be others like that in the future. But we, at, at this point in time, it doesn't make sense for one country to own a certain technology. We've got to actually find ways to do this together and, and for other countries to, uh, uh, respecting, there's certain limits in intellectual property rights that we have to respect. But there's, there's nothing to say that we can't achieve great strides together. 
So I think if you look at countries, for example, uh, Afghanistan, we did a tremendous amount of joint work with Afghanistan on finding uh, uh, land use, water reservoirs, things for agriculture that had never been cultivated there before, using very basic technology that we had developed here many, many years ago and deciding where to site some of our infrastructure that they had never utilized before, geospatial technology, very basic things. Uh, we've worked a lot in Africa. Uh, about ways to actually better suit their transmission network uh, so they can achieve more efficiencies and broader access to populations and rural populations. We've done a lot of work jointly on rural solar applications. It doesn't have such of an application here, but it does in the developing world. So I think there has been. I think ultimately it's not a judgment on uh, you know, what has – it's whether the, the, the businesses that actually end up owning this technology are investing in some of these countries. And I think that's the benchmark over time that we'll be judged against. to ask you about the dialogue with producing countries about um, allowing investment in uh, the state-owned uh, oil and gas sector. Um, I don't know of anything that we've been able to realize yet in terms of prying anybody open or as opposed to slowing things from closing down. You know, as I said, uh, it is a very, very big challenge to get to these resources, and the resources, the reserves that are available today that are unexplored are geologically very, very challenging. They're very expensive to explore, and they need an incredible not only amount of capital but a lot of expertise. Uh, and while there are some very good state-owned uh, uh, oil companies, many, many oil companies do not possess that capital, but more importantly, the expertise to explore these reserves uh, and get uh, the return out of those reserves that is needed these days because you can ruin reserves and re reservoirs very easily because they are so geologically challenging and so you need to be very careful and use the most advanced technology and most of that advanced technology uh, is resonant in international oil companies. And so over the long term it will be a very big challenge if some of these very, very difficult uh, oil and gas reservoirs and reserves uh, are kept off limits to those with the capital and the expertise. We continue to try and explain that it's not an issue of sovereignty. Uh, it is not an issue of exploiting one's sovereignty. It's an issue of actually getting the reserves out of the ground so that the revenue can actually be shared between the people. It's either you get nothing or you get something. Uh, and certainly I think something is better than nothing. And whether it would be, um, you know, in, in Russia or Venezuela or any of the other producing countries, there are very challenging fields in those countries. Uh, and if they are not developed, the economy that really pays the price is not the consuming countries. It's the country in which the reservoir actually uh, is, is resident because the people there then don't have the benefit of the revenue and they can't use it for development or whatever might be the government and the people's priority. So it's, it's, it's an economic challenge to producing countries that elect not to, uh, because of lack of access to capital or expertise, develop these reserves. It may hold patriotic appeal, but it certainly does not hold any economic benefit. Well, they, all of these countries are certainly going to make their own decisions. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to make their own decision. It is not, uh, it is not us to, to, you know, actually try and make them for them. We are, we are not going to do that. Uh, you know, the Saudi Arabia has made a significant investment uh, in additional capacity in their country uh, and now new refining capacity and uh, will be expanding uh, their ability to deliver oil by close to 30 percent over the next 10 or so years. Uh, there are other countries uh, that are not. They do not possess the type of capital or expertise necessary. As I said, you notice what's happening in Venezuela with the state-owned oil company uh, production down 50 percent. That certainly is not a benefit to the Venezuelan people and the Venezuelan economy. And the social spending in Venezuela on a year-on-year -on -year -on basis was up 80 percent. The spending and investment in the hydrocarbons infrastructure, the state-owned hydrocarbons infrastructure, was down year-on-year -on, -year on basis 80 percent. 
that, tr that is not a sustainable path when you have social spending up and the actual source for that spending, uh, the investment in sustaining that infrastructure going down. So uh, that, those are cases for, that's a case for worry. Uh, certainly in Russia, which has tremendous reserves, uh, we certainly want to see some of those large fields that are very, very challenging uh, being brought to light uh, and are hopeful that uh, international companies will be allowed to participate in a very equitable and fair manner. Two quick ones. On the corner in the back over here and then we'll come over to your side. Thanks. This is Avery Cohn with the uh, United Nations Foundation. And um, I have a question for you about the, the challenge of energy independence in, in um, in the industrializing world, and what, if any, are the, the main barriers to achieving energy independence in net importing nations? And then also, how that squares with the problem you were just talking about, about the challenge of, of developing world nations um, kind of closing off their borders to, uh, to international trade and, and, um, and economic globalization. No, and thank you for that question because um, I should have addressed something earlier that I did not. I think one of the things that we need to, uh, uh, one thing we need to dispel here is that the notion of energy independence, complete independence. There is an integrated global energy economy. And uh, whether it be on hydrocarbons or others, it is like the global economy. It is an integrated economy. And while we are seeking to become less dependent on foreign sources of energy, uh, it is clear that nations around the world do not own reserves in their own countries to be able to sustain their economies for over the long term. There is going to be energy trade forever. Uh, and so whatever source of the energy might be, we are never going to be energy independent. We are going to continue to find ways to be less dependent. We are going to find ways to have alternatives. We are going to find ways to be less vulnerable. We're going to find ways to become more secure. We're going to become less vulnerable for price uh, fluctuations. Uh, but it is something that will continue to be uh, an integrated global economy. And what does that mean for the industrial, industrialized world versus the industrializing world? For the industrializing world, it poses an opportunity. Uh, and that they have the, the advantage of having technology out there that wasn't there before that will help them leapfrog into a much more advanced energy economy than before. It poses a challenge for them as well because it takes a great deal of money and investment. If you look where the demand is coming from in the developing world, a great deal of the demand, obviously, is happening in the developing world, a great deal of the investment, and that is where they're going to have to make the most adjustments in their policies to attract that investment. In the industrialized world, uh, our challenges are uh, in terms of diversification and having those additional options. And if you get those additional options, it requires concomitant infrastructure investments. And are those infrastructure investments going to happen? And are we, able going, are we going to be able to conquer nimbyism? Or somebody told me the other day, banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near me. You know, we have uh, a great need and desire in this country to have more liquefied natural gas, yet it's extremely difficult to get uh, uh, people to agree and communities to accept an LNG terminal. People want to see more use of wind in this country, but don't build it in my backyard. We need to be able to turn on the lights, but nobody wants to see where it comes from. So uh, we have to be able to uh, build the infrastructure necessary to deliver the energy that is required. And that is something that the industrialized world, and particularly the United States, will continue to grapple with. John Turpin from the Federation of Electric Power Companies of Japan. Um, one of the bright spots of the Bush-Putin meeting in Maine was their joint statement about nuclear energy cooperation. Does that signal um, a nearing of a civilian nuclear cooperation agreement between the U.S. and Russia? Uh, you know, we have a very mutually beneficial relationship with Russia in all aspects uh, on the nuclear arena. They have been a very strong partner in nonproliferation efforts, uh, not only uh, uh, joint work, uh, but certainly things uh, around the world, and we value that relationship tremendously. 
and it certainly was uh, highlighted in the discussions in Kenny Bunkport and in subsequent discussions between Secretary Rice and her counterpart here in Washington that immediately followed the meetings up in Maine. And we are on a path to have greater civilian nuclear cooperation with Russia. Uh, it, it certainly is a very complex negotiation. These things take time. Uh, you know, I like to remember that uh, we have a civilian nuclear agreement with Japan, and uh, this is a country that possesses no nuclear weapons, and it took us five years to negotiate that agreement. Uh, so this isn't something that one takes lightly. It's a very complicated, complex process that one wants to do very thoroughly, and we will do that. But it is certainly a great desire for us to increase our collaboration, both bilaterally and multilaterally. As I said, some of the initiatives that we are pursuing very aggressively have Russia as a partner, but include other nations. They include France. They include Japan. They include China. Because we want this to be something that is available to all, and that there is not a, you know, a, a, a greater uh, uh, partner than the other. That this really is seen as a partnership as we're moving forward to make nuclear power uh, more broadly available. We have been trying to uh, reach a similar agreement with India for uh, a little over a year now, and we're, we have reached, you know, our Congress gave us the approval to go ahead, and, and we're hoping that we reach, uh, that the, the Indian uh, Parliament reaches the same conclusion and so that we can proceed. So we are proceeding uh, on a number of fronts to expand uh, nuclear power, and Japan is a very important partner in that. They have a very strong presence here in the United States, uh, and we hope that they avail themselves of their expertise here. We can see some new nuclear power plants built here in the United States. So, a trip to Nigeria next week. Can you indicate at what sort of level you might be meeting officials, you know, at the top level? And also, um, you speak about discussing the normalization of supply, which is obviously very difficult. Um, are there any concrete examples of, of the ways in which the U.S. might be trying to assist, whether it be on the security front in the Delta or in terms of trying to find a political solution? Well, first, this is an overture to a new administration in Nigeria. Uh, they have yet to get all of their officials in place, which is completely understandable. We wanted to make the effort to get there very early on to establish a relationship with uh, the officials uh, there at whatever level. Uh, you know, it, it, will, it remains to be seen over the next couple of days if more people continue to be named or not. Uh, we certainly have plans to meet with very senior people uh, while we're there. Uh, I won't name names uh, quite yet, but we're very happy with the level of meetings we're getting, and we're very happy with the uh, discussions we'll be having with the companies that are truly on the front lines of some of the uh, challenging uh, terrain, literally, uh, in Nigeria and the security situation in Nigeria, and to get their recommendations on what might be done, recommendations that we can either pass on to the Nigerian government or ones that we need to bring back here and discuss uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, but it is, uh, it's the beginning of a, of a new administration, the beginning of a new relationship, and a recognition uh, that this is not in their interest to see it sustained over the long term. With the amount of oil that is uh, offline there, it could, as I mentioned earlier, could really bring significant revenue that would help them address some of the concerns that the rebels have, which is social concerns. And so uh, if it's, it's a, it's a catch-22. They need the revenue to meet some of the demands, but they can't meet the revenue because they can't get the oil to the ground because of the insurgency. So uh, it's, I don't have any concrete you know, deliverables to come out of it except for what we hope to be uh, the beginnings of a far more robust uh, discussion with uh, the leadership in both the private sector and the public sector uh, in Nigeria. Karen, thank you. As always, your remarks are thoughtful, insightful, comprehensive, and you've managed to retain your sense of humor. For all of you, uh, please join me in thanking Karen Harbert. Uh, this will be available on, on the webcast, and we're going to try to put together a transcript as well. So for those of you that took good notes, good for you. The rest of you will probably have it up for you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you.